Psalm 1, Mary Young. Well, I grew up uh, pretty close to this river. Uh, when I first came to Detroit in the early 20s, uh, 1923, as a matter of fact, I lived at St. Alban and Antietam, not too far from Joe Muir's. I grew up uh, in this town, uh, most often uh, very close to this river. Uh, when I first moved to Detroit and... Can you do it once more? I'm a little slow. Can you do Valerie Reese? Same thing. Sure. Okay. That's all right. Okay. I'll just take it on the, on the voice, okay? And glasses on, Your Honor? Yeah, he's got you. Yeah, same thing. It was our... 1923, my family uh, first moved to St. Alban and... Antietam, about three blocks south of uh, Joe Muir's. And shortly afterwards, uh, moved to Russell near Congress, which is very, very close to the river. As a matter of fact, uh, when I went to the Army in 1942, some 20 years after I come to the city, uh, I left from St. Alban and Maple uh, in Black Bottom, and uh, my family lived there right up until uh, the end of the war when we moved further uh, east. Well, Black Bottom... Uh, uh, Black Bottom uh, is the area of Detroit, uh, generally south of Gratiot, uh, east of Hastings Street, what is now Chrysler Expressway, and extending all the way over to Mount Elliott, the sort of triangular pie-shaped uh, piece of land. And of course, the southern boundary was the river. Uh, the oldest black community in the city of Detroit was located uh, in Black Bottom. Across Gratiot and to the north uh, was Paradise Valley, Hastings Street, and another old segment of the black community in Detroit there was one other sizable uh, black community in the 20s and 30s, and that was the West Side. Uh, these were the principal uh, black communities uh, in the early days. There were smaller communities in Conant Gardens and the North End, uh, as we call it. But the basic one were the East Side, divided between Hastings Street and Black Bottom, and the West Side. Well, it, in those days, uh, perhaps even more so than today, uh, we all attended the same schools. Uh, in my case, uh, Duffield. I went briefly to Barstow, to Capron, to St. Mary's, uh, to Miller, and then to Eastern. Uh, People moved an awful lot because these were hard times in the main, uh, depression times mostly, uh, but largely within the same neighborhood. Uh, the black community had not begun to expand dramatically uh, as it did later on. As we approached World War II, it began to explode because workers from all over the South, uh, black and white, were coming to Detroit uh, in the late 30s uh, to work in the auto plants and uh, to participate in the booming uh, defense industries that were centered in Detroit. Hold on one second, Your Honor. I want to get personal. Um, I want you to tell me about the smells and the sounds and the feelings that you
well, some of the early smells I remember uh, in our neighborhood were, first of all, the smells of Eastern Market. I've mentioned that before. Uh, one of my earliest visits uh, as a youngster, within a week after I came to Detroit, 23, was Eastern Market uh, during the Christmas time. And uh, I remember very well the smell of the fresh apples, uh, the sharp uh, smell of snow, uh, the various types of uh, restaurants uh, on the market, all types of food uh, being cooked there. Uh, out in the community, uh, the strong smell of barbecue ribs uh, was uh, very characteristic of, of my neighborhood. Uh, I had a cousin who had a barbecue place most of the time within a couple of blocks of where we lived. And so I was very familiar with and fond of uh, of that smell. The sounds, uh, there were a lot of automobiles, obviously. We spent a lot of time uh, counting uh, Fords and Chevys. And uh, and there was a the smell of horses uh, in the air. Uh, after uh, the stock market crash, uh, going into the 30s. The sounds uh, outside of automobiles honking uh, was long before stereo. I remember particularly some of the blues I heard. Uh, my mother was not uh, sold on many of the graphic uh, lyrics attached to the blues. And I remember one time I got a pretty good whipping for singing the, the line to a blues song, something about some black snake's been sucking my rider's tongue or something like that. <laughs> but I'll never forget that song. <laughs> Most of it was illegal. A large part of it was illegal. Uh, it was located physically along St. Antwine, uh, north of Gratiot, up to Adams. And on Adams, it extended uh, west to Bobian, some people say to Brush, and east to Hastings, that little T. It included a little short street called Beacon, that was south of and parallel to Adams, uh, and it included Madison as it comes into uh, St. Antoine, then as it does now. And uh, But these big bands uh, didn't come to Paradise Valley. Paradise Valley was an intimate place of small uh, nightclubs where you had uh, second-rate or mid-rate entertainers. There were some pretty good ones. Had a whole lot of female impersonators and things like that. It's, it's over-glamorized in terms of Paradise Theater had all the big acts, and that wasn't in a Paradise Valley. which already was outside of Paradise Valley, was on John R. That was uh, as the black community expanded. It, it, the black community went way beyond Paradise uh, Valley. I don't know. I think uh, commonality of uh, houses, of housing locations. Uh, I don't think it's any more than that. 
Um, people tend to gather according to ethnic or racial identity. Now, that's a natural thing among most national and ethnic groups. Uh, over and above that, uh, among black people, it's an enforced uh, isolation because it's difficult uh, to break out. And uh, black people don't integrate into the general population as other ethnic groups do. So um, once people, you know, it, 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 I guess when strangers come to a city, and Detroit is, a, as I said before, is basically a, a city of immigrants. Detroit uh, it, it literally exploded beginning uh, in the, just before World War I, when the big wave of The whole area known as Elmwood Four, uh, that is uh, between uh, Congress and Larned, uh, between uh, the Quinder and Mount Elliot, is Elmwood Four. And you have the Ralph Bunch homes, uh, the Martin Luther King homes, and the gas company homes all through there. Now, those people are original residents of Black Bottom who moved from Elmwood Three before Elmwood Three was torn down. And then uh, in places like Franklin Wright Settlement, where the McDonald's live, uh, new housing was built and uh, other former residents uh, moved in. In fact, they got uh, priority in relocation. So what you have today, uh, where Black Bottom was, is uh, Lafayette Park, Elmwood, Two and Elmwood three, uh, a diversified uh, community, diversified economically, ranging all the way from uh, middle class and in some cases upper middle class professionals uh, to uh, average working people with a few seniors and uh, subsidized uh, housing residents mixed in. You have uh, black and white, the old longtime resident as well as a relatively new people. I think it's one of a, the ideal communities. Uh, almost accidentally, the new Elmwood, uh, the new Black Bottom is what the old Black Bottom was in the sense that uh, it's not all one economic level. Uh, old Black Bottom was like that. You had McDougal Street, which was the fancy street, the street of fancy homes in what was generally a working class uh, neighborhood uh, as a reflection of uh, how important McDougal was to old Black Bottom uh, when Joe Lewis won a championship, he achieved his highest lifetime ambition. He bought his mother a house on McDougal. And uh, that spelled success to everybody. Everybody knew Joe had made it then. So uh, Elmwood uh, Black Bottom today is different from what it was, and yet in many respects, it's the same. The central feature of a neighborhood is a community of interest, people living together in a common geographic setting, and by virtue of that setting, they come to know each other. They shop in the same stores. Uh, their children will go to the same schools, or if you're kids, you play together. Uh, their lives uh, become uh, intertwined uh, by virtue of the fact that they are neighbors. You know, a neighborhood is just that. A community and a neighborhood are the same thing. A group of people uh, who develop a common interest as a result of work, of living together, living close at proximity to each other. As a matter of fact, uh, groups who are strange to an area, and Detroit is a city of largely strangers, Almost everybody in this city has come here in the last 60, 70 years. 
uh, tend to group and live close to others of their kind. Now, the same thing happened uh, to the Poles, the Italians, and other immigrants who came here. And so you start off uh, with the people that you know. There's a sense of security, I think, uh, in people that you know, where the language as you know it is spoken. You know, whether you're a, <laughs> again, whether you're Italian or German or uh, black, uh, there's, a, there's a, a language that's different. There's a language difference. So I think all these things uh, make a neighborhood, you know, a common economic way of life, a common uh, geographic location, a common culture, in many cases, a common religion. Is there something very special about Detroit? Well, I think more than, more than, uh, more than um, most uh, cities, uh, Detroit's neighborhoods uh, have endured uh, because there's such diversification. Uh, and here, there has been an intense pride in uh, the, the ethnic uh, differences and the cultural differences. I think that we have uh, managed to uh, achieve a large degree of unity among people of diverse uh, cultures and ethnic and racial backgrounds, uh, while at the same time preserving that which is best in the things that make us different, our culture, etc. Now, uh, there are some who might dispute that. Uh, a lot of people get mad when I talk about the fact that racism is a fact of life uh, in Detroit and in Michigan, but I think that it's true, and there are many, many evidences of it. I think that you first have to recognize that racism does exist and that it's a negative thing before you can do anything about it. And I believe that uh, that recognition is a little more common today than it was at one time. And I'd like to believe that we're beginning to do something about it. Talk about people who are really caring about each other. There is some, well, we only have 30, so we're going to change to get through this. <laughs> well, Detroit is a, a very generous city, a city where people are concerned with each other. Uh, we break records uh, yearly in terms of the size of the contribution to the March of Dimes, the Community Chess United Fund, almost any type of uh, group endeavor that requires giving, uh, that elicits expressions of uh, support uh, and care for each other, uh, does very well in Detroit. Okay. One more. We have to blow in some more film. Bye. Take a break. Well, what happened with fire coaches? Cracking like crazy. Sound five. Are you going to Should we do something? What do we do about the fire? Well, it's crackling and popping. It's a cozy uh, autumn day. What the day. hell? <laughs> okay. You talked about what makes a neighborhood. Um, My theory of what makes a neighborhood. <laughs> Your theory. Let's talk about what is really special about the city. Well, I think that uh, the thing that's really special about the city is the warmth of its people. But it's not a warmth of weakness, it's a warmth of strength. Mm -hmm. The strength of its people. What's the question again? About what makes it special. Oh, I. I think that uh, the most special characteristic of the people of this city is their warmth. A warmth uh, that's not a weak warmth, 
because it's warmth and strength, the ability to reach out to one's neighbor and to care for the city and for your neighbor. And the strength at the same time and belief in yourself, belief in your city, to persevere in the face of uh, incredible hardship. And Detroit, since it's an automobile city, it's probably geared better than most to the extremes. This was, I believe, Detroit at its very best. This is the period of during which uh, no one locked their doors at night. There was practically no crime in our city. Uh, right after uh, that giddy period uh, came the stock market crash and the long depression that actually began in 1929 and got deeper and deeper through the 30s and ju had just begun to level out uh, as we approached to World War II. In fact, there are some people who believe we never would have recovered from that depression had it not been for Detroit becoming the arsenal of democracy during World War II to help supply our allies long before we got into the war. But from the period of a height of prosperity in the late 20s to the depth of depression in the early and mid-30s, the same rigid strength and warmth uh, uh, characterized uh, the people in our city. And I believe that uh, you can see uh, that tradition, that heritage uh, in Detroiters today. Uh, we've gone through a 10-year period, uh, starting back about 75, that's almost as rough, in some respects rougher, than the 10-year period that followed uh, 1929. Uh, but the people have been ha have faced these crises with the same characteristic of warmth and courage, and now it would seem we're beginning to emerge from a period of a uh, severe economic uh, stress. Well. I've been a Detroiter all my life. I never had any thought, any serious thought, of being anything uh, but a Detroiter. Uh, the longest period I've been away from the city was uh, during World War II when I was away in the Army for four years. Uh, I think that one of uh, my greatest feelings of exhilaration was uh, approaching Detroit by car. Uh, in 1946, or 40, 46, 45, when I had been discharged from the Army, late 45, and uh, just the, the joy at uh, being home. I feel that I know the city. I feel that I know its people. And uh, I suppose it's provincialism. Uh, it's <laughs> but I just have to believe that Detroit is a special people. When I was in the Army, you could tell someone from Detroit, they had a particular know-how. They stood out in almost any crowd. Detroiters compare favorably with New Yorkers, with Californians, with Texans, uh, anybody you want to see. Uh, if you're from Detroit, uh, you can make it to paraphrase a song anywhere. I've never had any thought of living anywhere else. Detroit is my home. I love it. Okay. Drop, the drop the distraction, okay. Okay, and say to me and warm up to me. Okay. Um, That's what I like this kind of. 
I've never had any thought of living anywhere else. Uh, Detroit is my home. I love it. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, 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 if I do it again, I'll have it up. <laughs> Okay, all right. <laughs> I've never had any thoughts. Let's do that again. I've never had any thoughts of living uh, anywhere else. Detroit is my home. I love it. I should have said serious thoughts. So sometimes in February, I wonder how the weather is in the desert. I'll go to the limits of my arthritis. <laughs> arthritis. <laughs> Yeah. 